All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us for this morning's webinar, Five Reasons Why PFS is Not a Silver Bullet for AI. Um, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you'll see a button at the bottom of your screen uh, where you can drop any Q&A questions. Uh, we'll be answering them throughout the fireside chat portion of the webinar. Um, and then if we don't get to any of your questions, we'll, hand, we'll answer them um, after the event. Let me just get us going here. All right, so I wanted to uh, to share our speakers for this morning. Um, Kartik, who is you know our resident PhD, he's our global systems engineering lead. Um, thanks so much, Kartik, for joining us today, and uh, looking forward to uh, your presentation. Um, and then we're also joined by Leon Clayton. He's uh, our field CTO for advanced analytics. So, welcome, Kartik and Leon. Uh, one note before we we before I hand it off to Kartik, one note I wanted to share. Um, if you have any questions, even you know, even if it's during the webinar or after the webinar, um, we have folks uh, available 24/7 on on our website. Uh, you can see uh, our live chat on our homepage and even on you know different pages like our AI page. Um, you can also just visit us at vast.com forward slash AI if you have any questions. Um, our team is standing by. So, with that, I will hand it off to you, Kartik. All right. Uh, hey, folks, welcome. And, uh, you know, thanks for attending this little webcast over here, just so we can learn a little more about AI and uh, what kind of storage is best for it. Um, so there's been a very interesting uh, switch in the market uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. And that's uh, uh, traditionally high performance computing environments would run on various types of parallel file systems, which are excellent for it because the data patterns were actually a lot of numerical simulation and you had a, some amount of data coming in and a lot of data coming out, uh, especially different checkpoints, et cetera. Uh, and therefore the systems that were built to support this from a storage standpoint uh, were built for large block sequential workloads, uh, either reads or writes. However, with artificial intelligence and you know, you know, specifically machine and AI and, uh, and specifically machine learning and deep learning, uh, that IO pattern has changed. The act of training a machine learning model, think GPT, you know, three or, you know, um, any kind of image recognition software, uh, you have a large amount of data that would go in and a very small amount of data actually comes out, which is actually the trained model itself. And so this is very data intensive, A, eh? plus the read, the access patterns for this data are dominated by reads. In fact, they're dominated by random read patterns. And this basically means that, uh, you know, you cannot be using the same kind of technology which you use for parallel file systems for HPC workloads now for artificial intelligence because those systems were not built for random reads, they were built for sequential reads. And so this has actually turned out to be a very major problem in a lot of our customers who are trying to now balance high performance computing with the needs for AI. And increasingly HPC clusters are coming in with both a uh, large number of GPUs as well as large number of MPI jobs. How do you really make sure that your architecture works for both is the key thing. The natural answer for that is of course, what if we use systems which were based on solid state disk? all flash systems. If you go on to the next slide. Um, if you, now, if you see uh, what's been happening in the industry, and this is a little table I just compiled a lot of information that is totally public. You'll see that every single NVIDIA reference architecture that has been published, either for uh, what they refer to as their base pod or their super pod, and it's not just NVIDIA. Uh, we've tested with GraphCore, we've tested with Samanova, we've tested with Habana. The only type of system that they have tested and inserted in their reference architecture is an all flash system. All of them use SSDs, none of them use HDDs. This is no coincidence. This is because HDD based systems are not good at random reads. And uh, SSDs on the other hand, don't care whether it's random or sequential. So an SSD-based system does well for both traditional HPC workloads and it does extremely well for AI workloads, which is why we're starting to get to a point where it is mandatory that we use HPC, uh, we, 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 mandatory that we use SSDs for all kinds of workloads that are emerging in this new world of high-performance computing. Now, I should mention that 
AI workloads also need access to the entire namespace, which means it can't just be a small part of SSDs and a whole bunch of other hard drive based stuff, because then you have to worry about how to move data between these two tiers, uh, how to manage the workloads and how to manage the performance. If some of the data is on hard drives and some is on SSD, you get extremely inconsistent results. And that is just not what people want. So with that, let's open up the discussion. And I want to pull Leon in. Leon is a very old friend of mine, and he's exceptionally experienced in this. But uh, let's let's like you know very quickly ask if, if there are any questions uh, which, which have come so far from what we've discussed. Yeah, definitely. And then you know we're gonna kind of transition to kind of a fireside chat portion of the of this kind of the main event, if you will. Um, so if you do have any questions as we go, uh, we'll be answering them live. Um, and if you for some reason we can't get to them, we'll get to you know we'll we'll follow up with you after with an answer to your question. Um, but yeah, we got five reasons why, and uh, we're gonna dive into reason number one right now. All right, reason number one, uh, for parallel file systems, high, high performance equals high complexity. I'll pitch that off to you, Leon. Um, yes, yeah, so when we start using parallel file systems, um, they are quite difficult to maintain in the fact that when you deploy them, uh, there's complexity involved inside there. There's tuning required to be able to get the best out of them for certain environments. But with that complexity also comes the consideration of the client side, not just of the storage system. And what we mean by this is there is a parallel file system client, which has deep hooks into the kernel, which you have to install on all your clients to be able to access the file system. And this cause this interconnection of the actual file system and the client means that when you come to do normal things that you would do, like upgrade your file system, upgrade clients, patch them for security, uh, and various other routine maintenance tasks become very, very difficult. And what I mean by that is, you know, a simple thing that we have a patch, we have a bug, we have a problem. Upgrading a parallel file system isn't just a case of doing the central storage. You've got to schedule downtime to disconnect all your clients to upgrade those to be able to allow them to work in the file system. And what I've seen in the field many, many times is years worth of backlog of updates, or particularly customers not wanting to do the upgrades and build new file systems rather than go through the upgrade process. And I don't think you've seen, have you seen anything like that, Kartik, where uh, people struggle with just general maintenance tasks, not just about the, the, uh, the complexity? I, you know, I just want to be interested whether you have any thoughts there. Absolutely. We've, we've, uh... You know, we have had quite a lot of success in uh, in, in our customer base uh, replacing parallel file systems for exactly that reason, Leon. Uh, like, you know, a good example would be uh, one of our good customers down under Geo, uh, who's, uh, you know, centered in Australia. Uh, they actually ran, uh, ran a parallel file system. In fact, the author of the parallel file system was the CTO for Doug for a long time. And uh, his statement was they would get two or three trouble tickets every single day uh, for performance reasons. Uh, and uh, now after they moved to VAST, they are down to almost nothing. Because the other aspect to consider here, and you know this very well, Leon, uh, some of the systems you have built are some of the largest in the world. Um, it's a question of scale as well. When we have very large systems like that, that's a lot of moving parts. And when you have a system as a parallel file system, it requires an enormous amount of chasing down every single thing that's going on in the system. And there are thousands of tunable parameters. There's all kinds of performance trade-offs that you have to make. Every day a job that ran fine a few days ago doesn't run fine now, and someone has to go and check and see what's going on over there. At scale, these problems become almost impossible to deal with. Most parallel file system customers I have need several PhDs on staff because the, the clients you talked about are very intrusive to the kernel of the operating systems which are running on the clients. And this means that <clears throat> you have to have experts who are who always on the ball, always looking out for issues and always trying to solve them. All of that goes away when it comes to a system like VAST. But so the, the, yeah. the, positive, the positive side to having a parallel file client is the speed. You know, to play the devil's advocate, you go to a PFC to be able to have speed, to be able to service these workloads. 
So I'm interested, I know, I'll ask you that question if you don't mind. I, I'm interested to know why you think VAST is different in that respect. What have they changed? How can they not have a parallel file system client and do NDU upgrades, but also meet the speed uh, and simplicity? And I'm just interested in your views there, Kartik. You're, you're, you, this is one of the most common reasons why people express skepticism when they encounter technology like VAST. Uh, because historically, their experience, <clears throat> you know, note here for anybody who hasn't is not aware of this, <clears throat> VAST exposes itself only through industry standard protocols. We use NFS or SMB or S3, we're a naturally multi-protocol system, we have a great CSI for container-based workloads as well. Neither, you know, for high-performance computing, NFS has never enjoyed a reputation for good performance, neither has S3. S3 has always been looked at as, oh, that's an archive sort of protocol. I've got to put it in Glacier or something really, really slow. And so people do a double take when you go to them and say, yeah, this can actually perform fast. Uh, they say, wait a minute, isn't NFS restricted to about two gigabytes a second? And that's a true statement uh, for the standard upstream kernel implementations. But we made a few enhancements in the NFS client that allow a single client in fact, a single mount point to be able to access the entire scale out cluster that we have at VAST, very large namespaces. Interestingly enough, when we do that, then our performance is as good as any other parallel file system out there, in some cases, even better than any well, other parallel well, file play, system. Playing the, play the devil's advocate to what you've said there, Kartik, the enhancements to the NFS stack. Is that not what we're claiming the proprietary parallel file system client is? So how does that differ in that respect in your terms? Uh, I have my own views, but I'm interested in yours. Yeah, so now you can get some of this without any proprietary client at all, because upstream, more modern upstream kernels uh, for Linux have the ability to do something called nConnect on top of the standard protocol, which is NFS over TCP. And that would enhance performance to some extent. Now, the other thing that we did very early was to ask the question, do we have to run NFS over TCP as a transport protocol? Can we use RDMA instead? And the fact is that if you use the combination of NConnect and RDMA, you can pretty much saturate a 100 gigabit NIC, NIC on a client. So you only need the additional features to be able to talk to the whole cluster if you want to exceed that amount. Now, to address your real point, which is, wait a minute, that's these enhancements smack of being a proprietary client. We have made these enhancements um, and they are not coupled with the storage operating system. They're completely different. We will never force you to upgrade your client because you've upgraded your storage system. But we've also contributed all the code to this to the open source community. In fact, we are working with Linux maintainers to incorporate this inside the Linux kernel itself. So we expect that this would be a great benefit for all of the industry, not just for us. Uh, we do not charge any money for it. So this is the reason why we feel that this is not a proprietary client. We feel this can be used by any client anywhere uh, if that enhances the storage. So it is ultimately destined to be a part of the NFS client uh, in the specification in the Linux kernel itself. That's a, it's an interesting differentiation. I just wanted everybody you know, everybody to be understand that this is a difference. There is no tie between the storage and the client, and you can do those independently and keep going. And a part of my experience, I built some pretty big clusters, as you know, Kartik, out there. Um, mm -hmm. We've got systems delivering over petabytes uh, of data mm -hmm. and to very large AI and HPC usage. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, you know, those customers are only now starting to look at the enhanced uh, NFS throughputs that we do with RDMA, etc. And most of it is based on TCP. So you don't need a specialist network to be able to do this, etc. And that actually, I was going to ask really? you about this also, Leon. Okay. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, you built very large clusters. Can you tell me how much read throughput some of these clusters are able to do? I know that you built a very large namespace recently. So we, uh, in operations, we've got multiple clusters that are north of one uh, terabyte per second. Uh, we are pulling out at the moment clusters that are in excess 
of 2.5 terabytes per second. Um, and then, you know, put this into context, when you, you start benchmarking these systems and a customer gives you 100 clients, that is not enough clients with 100 gig networks to be able to drive the cluster to maximum performance. So these systems are data size, data center size supercomputers with a combination of HPC and AI and GPU nodes inside there running mass jobs. And at this scale, you can't just have storage, which as a client, this is a combination of understanding the network, understanding the clients, understanding the storage protocols and optimizing throughout the stack. So, you know, building those environments, we very much become a trusted, a trusted advisor to be able to say, okay, these are the pitfalls that you may encounter. This is the way to go. And it's more of a partnership than a piece storage. Um, go and do it yourself. We, we operate in a slightly different way when we get to that scale. Uh, I don't know whether that answers your question, Kartik, but that's a view of how we do, uh, how I do things really. Oh, absolutely. The, the aggregate performance here is frankly stunning. You know, when you're talking about terabytes a second uh, throughput, that is an amazing uh, number by any standards. Uh, hard pressed to even think of anybody who's really driving that other than a few rare customers out there. Um, but equally interesting, actually, is the fact that when a client does, when a single client does need a lot of throughput to a single mount point, which is very common in the AI world, we absolutely are able to deliver that. In fact, um, I was privileged and honored to be part of the team that did the benchmarking at uh, the NVIDIA labs for our systems initially about two years ago with GPU direct storage. And we were able to achieve an eye popping 162 GIB or, rough, or north of 170 gigabytes per second, single mount point, single client. The client was a beefy one, it was a DGX A100 with eight 200 gigabit uh, in HDR NICs on them. But the performance is absolutely stunning even for a single client. Uh, but aggregate performance, of course, across thousands of clients. And if I recollect correctly, Leon, I think uh, the customer you're referring to has over 4,000 GPU clients on them. And they're yeah, in they the do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting for the, for the clients that I, I'm seeing. I'm also seeing an incredibly valuable usage of both uh, S3 and high-speed NFS at the same time on the same thing. Um, and part of the original you know, question was, you know, NFS is viewed slow, but there's a conceptual out there that I keep coming across that S3 is also slow. And I'm interested in your views about having the same data available at line speed on both protocols and what that would mean for a customer's environment. A, have you got any thoughts on that? S3 has had even worse of a reputation than NFS when it comes to performance, if that all, if at all that's possible. Because right? S3 was always, since Amazon introduced it in the cloud, was always seen more of, 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 as an archive sort of protocol. This is where objects go to die. You know, that's the kind of <laughs> protocol you, that people looked at it as. Uh, but in reality, it's turning out that S3 is quite versatile. First of all, it's a uh, it's a very natural metaphor to refer to storage in a completely REST API-driven world that we live in today. Yeah. And, uh, and people are starting to use it for primary computation. Uh, for example, uh, turns out that almost everything in a Hadoop uh, ecosystem can work just fine with S3 as a backend instead of HDFS as a backend. So that is um, allowing people to start to move to S3, uh, you know, in, in mass. However, it's important to note that this can't be your grandmother's S3. It has to be high performance S3. For us, the way our protocol stack is laid out, both NFS and S3 have the equivalent performance. We provide very, very high performance over here. And this is not just in the Hadoop world, uh, the backends for common, you know, deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow and PyTorch now support S3. Cassandra will support S3. Spark will support S3. And therefore, the times when S3 was is, is, was relegated as a legacy protocol or a slow protocol are over. It's becoming a first-class citizen in the protocol world. It's becoming a first-class access uh, protocol, not just for analysis, but also for ingest. And therefore, it's going to increase in prominence. The other thing which I believe is going to really drive S3 adoption in the high performance space 
is that we are now approaching namespaces which are you know uh, mind boggling you know 10 years ago one petabyte file system was a big one now i think the system that you systems you worked on are 60 70 petabytes single file system uh, the idea of being able to go through an inode structure in that is starting to become less and less appealing and a much flatter object space uh, you know space with objects is probably going to be more and more preferred just as the scale of these systems increases. Yeah, would, would, would you would you agree with that, Leon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a bit of a loaded question, really, to be honest with you, Carty. I mean, well, what I see a lot in the a lot in the field is a, a use of Apache Spark type projects to do pre-processing, preparing data, etc. Um, that's commonly used over the S3 API because it makes the application portable. You know, you can develop in the cloud and bring on-prem when you start doing that or any combination of that. But once you start going to the big processing jobs, then S3 might not cut the mustard as a parallel file system because you need many threads. So the threading and the parallelization you need for S3 needs to be considered. And a single mount with a multi-path and end connect would actually enable that data, the same data to be generated by Spark, written to a single entity, and then processed in parallel by a very large compute farm. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of that motion there and a lot of customers who are looking at the HDFS particularly, not well, being controversial, not quite fancying the move to an ozone re-layout or a, a potential object store and move to a real object store enables that type of migration over to this type. And you know where they come from in HDFS and particularly ozone, they're not geared towards what I think is your opening slide about what AI workloads are, how they're different, and how they use the data. Um, so, yeah, I went slightly off topic there, but it's an interesting one. Can I actually jump in with a question from the audience? Uh, <laughs> right, we got a bunch of, we actually got a bunch of questions already. So, uh, we won't get to all of them, but uh, let me just start with this one. Uh, it's funny, this is a good question because we talk about this a lot internally. Uh, don't AI workloads require a lot of write performance that VAST can't deliver? Uh, maybe Leon, if you want to take this one. It's, it's an interesting it's, it's, question. Oh, you go ahead, Leon. Yeah. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting question, and and things I come across. Um, I deal with a lot of customers. I, I see a lot of requests, and it's automatically assumed that you need a balance between read and write. In my experience, this is wrong. It's a write workload as long as you can meet that write bandwidth. The majority, 95% upwards, is read and random read in that nature. So, you know, I think it's very easy for customers to have this, I need, you know, 100 gigabytes per second read and 100 gigabytes per second write. In my experience, that is completely off. It's more 90, 95 read than it is to write with all of these new type of workloads. There are always exceptions. Uh, you know, I'll give you that, uh, you know, and checkpointing systems on HPC is one of the obvious exceptions where you need to dump huge amounts of memory and checkpoint. But that's not really where VAST offers its benefits. That is just somewhere to checkpoint to. Um, so that's what I'm seeing in the field. And, and, and Kartik, I don't know whether you have a, a conception or some ideas around this as well. You're spot on, Leon. In, I've had, I've been able to benchmark dozens of AI workloads. Almost all of them are dominated. Both training and inference workloads are completely dominated by reads. That 95% reads is pretty accurate uh, as far as I can see in the market. And therefore, these are systems which will tend to be uh, heavily read intensive systems. Now, keep in mind that we are no slouches when it comes to write. It's just that our uh, read bandwidth is exceptionally high compared to our write bandwidth. And this often throws people off a little bit because I think through years of working with parallel file systems, they're conditioned to thinking that the reads and writes should be about the same. And uh, that is absolutely not necessary in this new world that we live in today. This is very, very much a thing which is dominated by reads. The two exceptions that you brought up were, were interesting, and I wanted to make one more comment about that because it's a very important thing here, is checkpointing. Now, 
where does checkpointing show up? It shows up in large, long-running HPC workloads very commonly, but it is also something which is fairly important for long-running AI models <clears throat> because we don't want to lose the work <clears throat> because of hardware failure in the middle of a job which may run for months. For example, you know, we had uh, uh, one uh, company in Korea which uh, trained GPT-3 in Korean. That run took about six months to run. Now, clearly, you don't want hardware failure in the middle of that to interrupt that and have to throw away intermediate work. So you need to be able or to check. Or, or upgrades. Or upgrades for that matter. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you need to keep the system alive. And that we'll talk more about upgrades in parallel file systems in a few. <clears throat> but when, when we encounter things like that, so specifically things like superpowered architectures, which will uh, which mandate that you have a certain amount of write bandwidth available, uh, those are not difficult for us to meet at all. We architect a system which will meet whatever write and read bandwidth you need. But the observational fact, the empirical data right now is dominantly that AI workloads are heavy, heavy read and fairly minimal right, but whatever the right requirements are, even for checkpointing, we are more than adequate to be able to cover that. Mind if I add something to this? It's, it's worth pointing out, like Kartik says, our right performance can be good, but we don't throw away right performance that is not there. We, we make an active conscious decision to use some right bandwidth to be able to protect the data efficiently, to reduce the data efficiently and be able to have this in a protection on this um, architecture that we've got in our system. So we effectively artificially reduce the right bandwidth on purpose to save cost. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's not like it's lost and it's not there in the architecture. VAST makes an active decision to use some of it to save the cost so you can afford flash for everything. It's one of the big differentiators for us with the data reduction across the entire file system. Uh, in my experience, the savings you get is equivalent to gzipping your entire file system against itself consistently and always on. And the systems are designed to run within these performance characteristics um, with all of this on. It's not like something you turn on and performance goes down. So I just wanted to point out that there's an architectural decision we made there as well for the misbalance between reads and writes. This is actually a crucial point you just made, Leon. I couldn't agree with you more. At the end of the day, the most whiz-bang technology on earth is useless unless it fits within a customer's budget. Mm -hmm. And without that, is, it's, it's a very, very difficult decision. Now, if we accept the premise that in the world we're moving into, both for HPC and for AI, solid-state-based systems are the only way to go. And hopefully I've articulated some of the reasons, but the, some of the other reasons to support that is also the rate at which solid state technologies are increasing. We are pretty saturated at about 20 terabyte hard drives right now, 25 terabytes, maybe 24 terabytes, something like that. Very hard to go beyond that without getting to zones of IO density, which make the drive pretty unusable uh, to access data from. Solid state, on the other hand, we're already using 30 terabyte drives. We'll be using 60 in about six months or so. We'll probably be going to 100, 120 next year. You're talking about densities which are so immense and the environmental impact for the, having that density is so in intense that we don't expect that there to be any price barrier between flash and, uh, and, and hard drives very soon, especially for active storage. Maybe archival storage is another story, but that's that's a different question altogether, right? But our primary objective is to make Flash affordable to our customers. Affordable enough that they can replace all the tiers that they need to be able to do whatever they want. In most parallel file system environments, you'll see a tiered environment. They'll have a small amount of Flash and a large amount of hard drives over it. Why? One and only one reason, cost. That's the only, only way to keep costs down. Nobody does tiering for any other reason other than cost. And I welcome anyone to challenge me on that. Uh, and if we do that, uh, then, uh, then you run into a very difficult problem of having to move data from your flash tier to your hard drive tier and back. 
and especially with multi-user environments, is how do you really move this data back and forth? There is no clean way to do that. And there's always going to be compromise. It's operationally complex. It is impacts performance. All those bad things happen over there. And none of those things would happen if you had an all-flash namespace. When it comes to all-flash namespace, we will be the cheapest. I can pretty much guarantee you that. Uh, because not only do we use the cheapest media, but we also have the ability, like Leon said, to use some of the capabilities that we have to reduce the data footprint uh, at a global scale across the board. And that cost then becomes the key differentiator uh, when all, all the chips are down for our architectures. You know, the, the operational complexity you were talking about is a good segue to our next, uh, to our next reason, actually. Um, so reason number two, parallel file systems are not built for non-disruptive operations. Uh, Kartik, let me hand this back to you. Yeah, and I think Leon already touched on several of these points earlier. Um, in this world of large-scale simulation in HPC or large-scale training workloads in AI, which could run for months, <clears throat> one of the key things that you have to demand from your storage solution is a 100% uptime and 100% freedom from any kind of maintenance operations interrupting that uptime. Our architecture at VAST being completely stateless um, is one that's perfectly tuned to doing exactly that. There are no operations in the cluster which need an outage, either be an upgrade or an expansion or a through replacement uh, any kind, no component failure will bring the system down. Um, the system that, the comment here, that actually includes any clients. New, no clients will get disconnected. Mm -hmm. No operations will need saving locally. I have customers, and I'm going to name them, not the customer, but I'll name their product, the product they use, which is Isilon. We start an Isilon upgrade in, in this environment, and at some random point in the next three days, their clients will all disconnect. And they don't know when it's going to happen. It's not planned. So how do you deal with this when there's random disconnects of clients when you have such mission critical workloads, which takes so long to do? And, and that's really a difference. Why I, I see customers on VAST running their systems at hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes a second and doing upgrades in the middle of the day and not even knowing, the customer's not knowing. And I think that's the, the big difference for me is people talk about it the reality across different vendors is very different. Yeah, this this non-disruptive operations is something we have not seen any parallel file system be able to achieve. Uh, and that is, to us, table stakes to play in the world that we play in these days. We're moving into an era where AI is going to dominate, and it's absolutely critical. And Leon's right. We work this way for stateful protocols as well as stateless protocols on the client side. We would never force you to do anything on the client side, uh, which you don't want to do, uh, just because we change something on the server side. Mm -hmm. This uh, our ability to go through with protocols like NFS4 or SMB 2.1 or SMB 3, all of those are really based very much on this fact that our architecture is able to be resilient even to any kind of planned operations within the cluster. Um, I think actually- Any questions, to... Boom? Yeah. Uh, one question on the, it's not necessarily on this, but it's uh, somewhat related. Um, so uh, this person saying, um, VAST looks very complex with Optane, RDMA fabrics and DPUs. How can this be easy operationally? <clears throat> So that's an interesting question, actually, where we, we talk, and vast we talk about a lot of those technologies you've said there. But the fact is we take the, the management out of this. Um, it's a single pane of glass, regardless of the size of cluster. Um, VAST talk about um, storage class memory. They talk about QLC and, and large capacity drives. They talk about all this. And we love to do that. We're techies. That's what we like doing. But the fact is the file system is just a single file system. You don't see any complexity. Um, for those that like tweeting, tweaking uh, figures and tweaking knobs, there's none. I, I like to say there's no nerd knobs um, on VAST. Once it's configured, it is a case of simply allowing access via VIP pools, uh, chopping your storage up via views, putting quotas on it, 
making it multi-tenants, putting QoS on those areas. It, it, it is as simple as a cloud type operation in how you provision it. All the complexity is dealt with within our software. Our software is built and runs within Docker containers, which means it can be upgraded really easily. Things can be restarted very fast. So having that development cycles and all the code within Docker really allows us to develop very fast. It allows us to upgrade. It allows us to go fast. And I think that's the crux of it. There's a, a technology choice in where we build our software, how we deploy our software. The components are all visible to everything. So there isn't one component that's more important than another, which is that disaggregated shared everything architecture, which is fundamentally different to the architectures of all the storage you'll see. Those two combinations together means that complexity isn't there. Yeah. Are there any thoughts on this, Kartik? Yeah, your, you know, the, the key point I want to emphasize and what Leon said is that we're not, even though it may look like we're a hardware company, we're not. We're not really tied to any of the, this componentry. Mm -hmm. We could use, you know, SLC as a technology instead of uh, Optane. Uh, we could use any other low cost media. Maybe PLC is coming out next. All of these are completely interchangeable as far as uh, we go. Uh, what our North Star is, is to make the cheapest possible systems for our customer. The most inexpensive systems for our customer and give, provide a full all flash namespace for our customer. Mm. So the complexity that that may, may, may be something that's on people's minds is, is negated by the fact that they never have to ever manage any of the physical infrastructure in here because the vast platform abstracts it completely away from what the customer has to deal with. And they only work at the presentation protocol level. Here's where the strength of files and objects really shines. It's pretty much you set up a file share or an export or an S3 bucket or an S3 endpoint, and the clients immediately are able to use it. You never have to worry about laying out the data or LUNs or carving stuff out or setting up metadata servers or any of that kind of stuff. It's all built into the system. And once you run it, it just stays up. And that's the key thing. Customers are delighted by the fact that once, once they set it up, they don't have to do anything more. Uh, trouble tickets go down to almost zero and the system just comes along as you go on. It's the number one impact of uh, introducing us in the, the stack. Thanks so much, Kartik. Um, all right, let's just for the sake of time, um, let's move on to reason number three. Uh, this is maybe more of an assumption that we're challenging. Uh, proprietary file system clients are a necessary evil. I'll hand this one off to Kartik. So these parallel file system have this thing called a native client. And a native client is one that's developed specifically for that storage platform, which means that that client cannot be used to talk to any other storage platform out there, A. B, they are built as native clients mainly because they want to maximize any kind of performance benefit they would get by interaction with the storage platform. Uh, and most of these use are what are called DMA clients, direct memory access clients. And to be to be able to achieve this, they use fairly low level uh, methods uh, from the client itself to talk to the system itself. These make these uh, many cases rather intrusive to the system kernel and very deeply tied to the uh, way the system is, uh, system operates. And as a result of this, when you upgrade the underlying storage system, many times you have to also upgrade the client. So there's some tolerance built in there but they will not tolerate any drift beyond a certain amount. This means that now I have to, I'm in this awkward position of having, say, in Neon, Leon's customer's case, we have 4,000 clients, which I have to touch just because I have to upgrade uh, the underlying operating system. That is something which is extremely cumbersome and not at all scalable and uh, quite disruptive to operations as well. So while we see why parallel file systems had to choose uh, these kind of in, in clients, 
uh, the way we've approached it at VAST is to say, no, we really want to use industry center clients for what we do. So you're not tied to a particular technology. And if you want to want, if you want to switch it out, then you could be, uh, you know, you can absolutely do that without having to touch anything on the client. Leon, what are your thoughts about that? You have a lot of practical experience, I think. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one for me that where you know, the, the clients on some circumstances can actually form part of the file system and the way they interact can be very, very weird. And, and I've seen there's some use cases that I'm seeing recently, and it's particularly about memory map type operations where that type of client looks like it might be good but it's actually horrendous for these mm map type uh, type scenarios which we bypass completely so in this point it's not just having you know we're as good as a as a parallel file system with all of the things we've mentioned today it's actually the fact that with certain operations we can be significantly faster um, and that's a good I, point, yeah, Leanne. I mean, there's one one workload which I have encountered a lot. As you know, I'm pretty passionate about AI, but I'm equally passionate about life sciences. This workload is one that mixes deep learning techniques with life sciences. It's a code called AlphaFold, and it's used for protein folding. It was released by uh, DeepMind, which is part of Google. And it uh, solves the a very, very complex mathematical problem uh, exceptionally well. Uh, AlphaFold use, makes heavy use of what Leon referred to, uh, MMAP files. So it has a large reference database, which it maps to physical memory. And, but it doesn't actually move the data to memory because it's too big to move into memory. But instead, it would have map a single page and shared memory to a block on the device itself. And unless there's a page fault, that is, the application needs that data, this data is not moved over there. Now, on the uh, storage level, the operations that it goes through look like a storm of random 4K IOs, 4K because that's the page size. And as we discussed earlier, parallel file systems have exceptional difficulty with MMAP operations. And often we've seen 500 to 700% uh, improvement in performance going to um, run AlphaFold on us. In fact, all the testing I've done indicates that we are as good as running it on local Optane drives on the client itself. Uh, these are also GPU driven workloads and they are very much AI driven workloads as well. So yeah, this here we are, we're not just as fast, but much, much faster than any parallel file system. Actually, I wanna move us on to uh, point number four here. Uh, so and I'll, I'll hand this one off to Leon, uh, no science project deployments. Leon, sorry, the floor is yours. I'm going to have to think about that one. Is that a real world answer there? Is it? <laughs> Do you have a think about this one, Kartik, first before? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's, I alluded to it briefly earlier. Uh, most uh, shops that have heavy use of parallel file systems, except, you know, especially large tiered uh, architectures, often need a staff of PhDs uh, to be able to run it. A real solid, Unix kernel people, uh, et cetera, to be able to do this. Um, in that sense, it does resemble a science experiment, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> uh, it needs a lot of exceptionally talented people who have studied the code uh, and how it behaves uh, really well and really, really understand how operating systems work. Commercial customers do not have the luxury of doing this, which is why parallel file systems I've had a pretty stable and steady home in the national labs. This is not to say that we are not in national labs as well. Most of the national labs in the United States are uh, vast customers as well, but they had a, surf you know, a surplus of a lot of good, exceptionally talented, uh, you know, science people to be able to run this. Uh, most commercial enterprises don't. Mm -hmm. So yeah, can you make something bespoke for every single use case? Sure you can, but it comes at a cost. And that complexity that comes along with it, that exceptional expertise that's needed is starts to be a real major problem. One of our largest customer bases is actually um, higher education institutes who get exceptional talent pretty much for free because they have graduate students and they have postdocs who work there who are very good and will help to operate it. But they have a problem. 
Once they graduate, they move on to new jobs. At that point, you lose all the tribal knowledge that's associated with operating a parallel file system, which is why most of them are, are looking at us and saying, we need something that's sustainable. We cannot be dependent on specific talent being around for us to run our operations. So that's been my uh, yeah. my observation here, Leon. Yeah, you, uh, you, you give me time to, for my brain to think. Thank you very much, Carty. Mm -hmm. but what, what I see with this point is um, things developed in isolation, but then deployed at scale. And that has very little context or feeling for what it stresses and strains it's going to put on the file system. So I've seen from science projects or development cycles, when you put them onto 12,000 cores, mm -hmm. the simple basic choices you can make can destroy parallel file system clients uh, and you know, file systems very quickly, in my experience. Um, you know, I'm not saying we're resilient to this in total. You know, I'm not going to be naive enough to say that. But deploying these and having knowledge and be able to work with the customer to say exactly what you are doing to the file system through analytical stacks, through data workflows, through statistics on the file system, and enables you to tune these science projects to make them faster and faster. And I'm seeing a lot of evidence in that in the field, of working with customers, seeing what's coming through and advising them, look, perhaps it's not good to go and do an LS in a million files in a single directory. Perhaps there's a different way. These things will take other file systems down, but not with us. Awesome. You know, I'm actually, you know, we're getting a lot of questions around, you know, VAST as a startup. Why would I risk, you know, my AI workloads on such a new technology? You know, how do I know VAST will be around in five years? Which I think is a great segue to our last point. Um, there is a better way. Um, so, you know, kind of considering a VAST as a startup, we understand where we're competing with, you know, people that have been in the industry for 30 plus years, um, you know, well, you know, we say there's a better way. Maybe Kartik, uh, you can kind of walk us through this. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a funny thing. You know, I, I joined VAST three years ago and uh, I had eight members in my team. Leon was one of my stars. He was a sole systems engineer running the globe, the international side of the business from UK. It was a lonely time, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very lonely time. Uh, and we were small and scrappy, you know, the first year of our existence, we had sold $5 million worth of stuff before we were even GA. <clears throat> but if fast forward now, I hardly think of us as small. Our market valuation as of two years ago, it was $3.7 billion. I think even in these down times in this economy that we are in right now, uh, we have increased our revenue over 10 times since then. I think our valuation will still is north of $10 billion at least. We're too big to even acquire by anybody else. There's nobody uh, nobody out there has enough money to actually buy us. But probably the strongest indication, the two strongest indications of our financial stability and why we will be around for many, many years to come is first of all, we have achieved a very rare benchmark in the financial industry for startups. Uh, our annual recurring revenue is over $100 million. That puts us in a rare class of startups called Centaurs, which are different from unicorns. Mm -hmm. Unicorns is just over $1 billion in valuation, but no promises on whether you're actually selling anything. Uh, on Centaurs, on the other hand, you have annual recurring revenue, which means this year, next year, the year after that, so on and so forth. We can bank on the fact that we have $100 million at least. Of course, we sell quite a bit more than that, and our ARR will go up as we go on. The second point which makes us completely solid on financial grounds is the fact that we have been cash flow positive now for two years. Cash flow positivity means that we can meet our obligations, such as payroll or SGNA expenses or whatever, without having to get any additional funding. We have raised $280 million in funding so far in the history of VAST. We have over $200 million of it still in the bank. We haven't had to touch it. In fact, we have zero use for it at this point, other than collecting interest on it at this point and investing it, <clears throat> because we are cash flow positive. 
So this makes us not just technologically viable with a, with a growth rate and hundreds of percent year over year, even in a down year, like through COVID and all that, uh, but also financially extremely stable. So most certainly we're not any anyone here who should, you know, which, which we have no risk profile, you know, compared to anybody else. Everybody else is shrinking. All the other scale out NAS vendors, all the other parallel file system vendors are actually shrinking rather than growing. And this puts us in a very unique position to take much more market share. But I'm interested in your perspective on this too, Leon. So it's, it's, it's I, I, a good I, question. I've come at this a, a different way. Uh, I've been here four years now. I will work with a very passionate, amazingly clever group. Um, they put pride in the company. They are willing to be advisors and go over and above for customers, relationships, we have with our customers are the most important thing. We are not about having 100,000 small customers. We're about having the right customers, the right relationship and, and building a good solution. Um, that's what really differentiates us, I think, from competitors uh, in the fact that that relationship enables us to work together to make mutual goals. Um, I've never had that with storage companies that I've worked with before. This is a very personal, it is a very intimate um, journey to be able to get to these sort of new systems that we're talking about. Um, that's why I think we'll be around. Uh, the money for me is a side point, um, but that's yeah, a techie speaking. <laughs> our, our culture is strong here. That's the thing, Boom, <clears throat> more than anything else. We we work tight. We, we still act like a scrappy startup, uh, but we're... We're a big company now, and uh, we are, we you know, you know, the latest Gartner. Uh, we are in on Gartner's Magic Quadrant. We are, <clears throat> we got fifth fastest company growing in in out of five hundred tech companies, faster than Moderna. In fact, uh, we've got award after award as you know number sixteen on Forbes list of best startups to work for. So we're we are sweeping awards. Number one HPC uh, Wire Award at uh, Supercomputing. It's a rare honor when an AS vendor is called out as the best product in a high performance computing conference, one of the premier conferences <laughs> in the world. It's a high honor. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's amazing. It's it's an amazing journey we are on, and we hope that you you will you will join us all on this journey. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, and let me. Uh, well, as we wrap up here, let me share this. Um, you know, if you, you know, if, if you want to learn more, uh, business at batstata.com, check out our success stories page, you know, everything that, you know, Kartik and Leon covered today, you can see how, you know, that, that looks in for, for use cases, just like yours. Um, and also if you want, if you want to talk to, uh, to someone from Vast, you know, our live chat is, is open 24 seven. Um, and, you know, of course we'll be following up with you on this webinar. If you, if you didn't get your, your question answered, you know, we'll follow up with you with the answer to your question. Um, but you know, with that, thank you so much, Leon. Uh, thank you so much, Kartik, for, for speaking today. And thank you so much for everyone for joining us. All righty. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a pleasure.